Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to be here. A senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Matthew Continetti works in the field of American political thought and history. His books include The Persecution of Sarah Palin, How the Media Elite Tried to Bring Down a Rising Star, and The K Street Gang, The Rise and Fall of the Republican Machine. He is the founding editor of the Washington Free Beacon, the former opinion editor at the Weekly Standard, and currently a contributing editor at National Review and a columnist for Commentary Magazine. In his new book, The Right, he provides a survey of the US conservative movement's evolution and intellectual history. Tonight, he'll be joined in conversation with Ramesh Panuru, the editor of National Review, a columnist for Bloomberg View, and the author of The Party of Death. Thank you both so much for being here. Screen is all yours. You're welcome, and thank you for that introduction. Um, I have been immersed, as you know, Matthew, in your book, uh, and uh, I'm uh, delighted to see that it's gotten such a positive reception in so many places. Um, but I, I want to start off our conversation by asking you to defend what seems to me a pretty misleading title, The Right, when uh, if anything, your book ends up suggesting, or really suggests from its very first pages, that there are multiple rights and that they are sometimes in conflict. Absolutely. Thank you, Ramesh, and thank you to the Philly Free Library. I'm happy to defend the title and the use of the definite article um, by referencing my subtitle, which is uh, The Hundred Year War for American conservatism. So what do I mean uh, by the right, by American conservatism, and by the war for it? Well, it struck me while researching and writing this book that um, even the American conservative movement that you and I are a part of is one formation uh, in a, amidst a much larger category of the right, which uh, is comprised of figures, groups, and institutions that are um, united in it, their opposition to the left, but who might not actually share all that much in common. When I say American conservatism, I really am referring to the movement conservatism, which had its origins after the Second World War, and which really orients itself around a defense of the American political tradition and in particular, the principles and institutions of the American founding, also known as constitutional conservatism. But in truth, that is only one variety uh, one encounters on the right. And there are several other rights, whether they are more populist in tone, uh, whether they uh, reject the American founding uh, and look toward uh, Europe, Europe for political guidance. And so the book is called The Right because I wanted to show first, that this broad universe um, uh, exists. And two, I wanted to tell the story of, um, at times, cooperation between the various groups, and at other times, conflict. So it's interesting that you talk about the conservative movement starting in the 1950s, uh, or after World War II, at least. And that is the typical self-presentation of conservatives when you know when we're, we're giving the after dinner party uh, talk about the history of the conservative movement. But your book actually starts in the 1920s rather than in the 1950s. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why you made that choice. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. Well, um, the first reason I made uh, the decision to begin the book in the 1920s was I wanted to provide a sense of what conservatives thought they were defending. And in order to do that, I needed to begin before um, the moment in politics where the, the right began to think of itself as conservative, that is, as conserving inherited institutions. So there are many types of conservatives, almost all of them uh, want to preserve or conserve or defend some something inherited, 
some type of institution that um, was passed on to them. In the American context, the conservatives really begin thinking of themselves as conservatives in the 1930s after Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And so I wanted to show in the 1920s how the American right at that time was very self-confident. Um, it didn't even think of itself as particularly conservative. It thought of itself as normal or standing for normalcy, as Warren Harding put it, or standing for Americanism, as both Harding and his successor, Calvin Coolidge, often uh, referred to. It was after 1932 and Franklin Roosevelt's election as president and the changes in the size and scope of the federal government that accompanied the New Deal, that the American right began to think of itself as conservative, that is trying to conserve the pre-New Deal dispensation. And so I needed to show a little bit about how that transformation took place. This, the other reason I wanted to talk about the 1920s and carry the story through the 2020s was that when you have this broader view, there are some political resemblances between the Republican Party of Calvin Coolidge and the Republican Party of Donald Trump. Now, Calvin Coolidge and Donald Trump are not alike personally, very different people, different backgrounds, different temperaments. But the Republican Party that they both uh, led actually shared a few things in common. Both Republican parties were very skeptical of foreign intervention and wary of entanglement overseas, particularly in Europe. Both Republican parties were um, very cautious toward involvement in the global economy, wanted to insulate America from competition, in Trump's case, uh, competition from China in particular. And both Republican parties are very skeptical toward immigration. Harding and Coolidge essentially um, signing bills that cut off immigration to the United States for four decades. Donald Trump focusing primarily on the border and illegal immigration, but you can also see in the, his Republican party, uh, broader efforts to reform immigration laws, change the nature of immigration to the United States and reduce legal immigration as well. So those are the two reasons I begin in the 1920s. Uh, one, to show exactly what it, the revolution was that conservatives were responding to, and that being the revolution of 1932, and then to illuminate some of the similarities between the Republican Party then and the Republican Party now. So the populist and elitist strains within conservatism that <clears throat> you point out have waxed and waned uh, at different times in uh, the, the history of conservatism, how do you situate Reagan uh, in that story. It's, um, you know, Reagan certainly, uh, again, to, to contrast your or compare your book to, to other conservative tellings of this history, Reagan is often sort of seen as the, the, the peak, um, that sort of everything before conservatism, everything before Reagan and conservatism is a working up to him, and then everything afterwards is a kind of falling away from him. Um, what's what's your view of um, the extent to which he was an elite conservative and the extent to which he reflected a more populist conservatism? Absolutely. Well, uh, a third reason uh, to begin the story in the 1920s and to tell the history of the American right over the last century is to um, turn Reagan not to the standard by which all conservatism is judged, as, as, as you put it, a kind of you know, either leading up to or falling away from, but actually portray him as one character in a cast that has many hundreds of characters. When you, when you broaden the scope of the investigation, Reagan's role, while still significant, is slightly diminished. Uh, and in fact, that's not necessarily a bad thing for him because it makes all of his uh, attributes and capacities and skills um, all the more unique in my story. What do I mean by that? Well, looking through it, uh, looking at it through this frame of uh, intellectual or conservative or Republican party elites, often in conflict or cooperation with the populist grassroots, Reagan is really one of the most successful 
um, figures in this history at synthesizing the two approaches. So um, one of the reasons I think he could do this was that Reagan had his own political identity, which actually preceded his entry into conservative politics. Ronald Reagan voted for FDR four times, right? He was a Democrat while he was the president of the Screen Actors Guild fighting the communists in Hollywood, as he would say. Even at that time, he had a very um, positive view of the individual. For him, individual freedom was the necessary condition of individual flourishing. And even when he was a Democrat, he resisted attempts from government or from totalitarians to squelch human potential and limit the individual. And that's something he carried on through with him as he entered conservative politics and Republican politics uh, in the 1960s. So he had his own set of principles and he was also tied to the conservative movement. So that meant that he had relationships with the founder of your publication, William F. Buckley Jr. He had relationships with Barry Goldwater, the Senator from Arizona and the Republican standard bearer um, for much of the 1960s and 50s. Um, but it also meant that he had a connection to the populist grassroots. Um, part of that connection was simply his own political talent. He, he had political skills that enabled him basically to appeal to every section of the, the coalition. Every part of that coalition saw in him what they wanted to see. In some ways, very similar to the role that Barack Obama played later with the Democratic coalition, mm. right? As an ecumenical figure, Reagan had that ability. But Reagan also was a savvy politician and he understood how to elevate issues that would put him on the side of the grassroots populists. Most controversially in the middle of the 1970s, he opposed the Panama Canal treaties, which, would, which returned the Panama Canal to Panama. Where Buckley and George Will were on the other side. Exactly right. So in that case, he was arguing against his friend Buckley and with the more populist uh, right. And one of his seconds actually in that debate was Patrick Buchanan the leader of the populist right uh, for many years. So he had this ability to kind of not only toggle between the two sides, elite, grassroots, populist, but also synthesize them. And when he comes into power in 1981, he's bringing all these elements of the coalition with him um, from the movement conservatives like Buckley to the neoconservatives, were primarily defense hawks. Here you can think of the former UN ambassador, Jean Kirkpatrick, uh, to the uh, new right populists, um, the Phyllis Schlafly types, for example, or even the religious right, Jerry Falwell and the moral majority. He, he kind of it was able to encompass all these viewpoints and direct them uh, toward um, a very successful presidency. Yeah, I suppose in the late 70s, you could say that where the Panama Canal Treaty fight put him on the side of the populace, his opposition to the Briggs Initiative was something where he sort of separated from this rising new right and moral majority, um, the California Initiative, which looked like it was going to pass, actually, until he came out against it, saying mm -hmm. that uh, gays could not be school teachers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in all these cases, um, Reagan really did his his work. He mm -hmm. would really think through these issues um, and kind of try to arrive at what he thought was a logical conclusion about them. And I'll, uh, I'll give you the example of um, abortion as well, an issue where he famously signed um, a very liberal bill while uh, liberalizing abortion law in California while he was governor. Um, by the time he's president and the GOP is becoming a pro-life party, uh, Reagan has um, really adopted the pro-life cause as its own, even issues a small book called Abortion and the Conscience of the Nation in 1984. And when he kind of announces his views on this subject in the 1970s in a, in a radio commentary he gave, it's a kind of a funny thing to read because, or listen to because he kind of reasons out his position on the basis that of a case where um, the, a mother died and 
childbirth. Um, and so uh, the uh, baby actually inherited the property. And so he said, well, if a fetus has property rights, then it, the fetus must be alive, right? And this, this led, leads him to uh, his new position. So uh, I think that was the same case with the Panama Canal treaties. He, he would often get very technical um, in, his, in his relation to these issues, um, the Riggs Initiative, and then of course, um, even defense issues and tax rates. He really always did the work. One of the uh, reviews I uh, ran across uh, just in the course of reading um, was uh, suggesting that there was something sort of uh, groundbreaking in your treatment of um, race uh, and the acknowledgement that um, racial bigotry um, played an important role in the history of U.S. conservatism. Um, and um, having, you know, I sort of, I guess I didn't didn't have quite the same reaction uh, when I read it, but I wonder what 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 you think of that. Well, um, yeah, I, I it's definitely not groundbreaking when compared with most studies of the American right that are written by liberals, mm -hmm. um, uh, which tend to very much focus on the history of race relations and the conservative movement's uh, relationship to the civil rights movement. Um, which you know coincided with it. Um, I, I do think that it's slightly unusual for a self-identified conservative such as myself to talk about the history in such a way that mentions some of the, um, the some of the blots on the conservative mm -hmm. record. Um, and as I say in the book, I do think that the conservative movement's opposition to the 1964 Civil Rights Act was a mistake. Now, uh, there were different types of opposition to the Civil Rights Act. Uh, the opposition of someone like Barry Goldwater, who um, was uh, active in the Arizona NAACP, who helped desegregate the Senate, who said he would have supported the Voting Rights Act in 1965 had he been in the Senate, kind of missed a turn um, because of his uh, presidential run, but who opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act and um, did so on constitutional grounds. Um, that's different than some of the other rhetoric that was coming from the right um, at the time, uh, which was uh, constitutional and libertarian grounds, right? I mean, he didn't want he didn't want mm -hmm. the regulation of private. Uh, that's right. Yeah, he, he and he had focused, some federalist concerns as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he focused on um, basically the public accommodation provisions and. He also uh, worried that the law would end in um, racial quotas in employment um, and admissions. Um, but then there were others, other conservatives who were just more cultural in their arguments than um, bigoted. Um, and so I, I, I thought you had to include all of that as well in mm -hmm. history. Um, and a lot of those, I mean, there were just some significant arguments in the pages of National Review. Yes. You, you know, I mean, National Review, I don't need to tell you, um, always kind of saw itself as a platform for the various strands of conservatism, um, various factions on the right. And uh, that included um, a, a fair representation of Southern thinkers, um, Southern conservatives who defended um, Jim Crow and segregation um, uh, on various uh, ra rationales. Um, including um, James J. Kilpatrick, the Kilpo, a very prominent mm -hmm. Southern journalist, um, and really National Review's chief political correspondent for, for many decades. Um, I feel that- He was the, on the, the pro-segregation side. I think he was, was on the pro-segregation side, yeah. Yes. And then um, later, of course, he got involved in a lot of other interconservative debates where he was on the pro-choice side of the abortion argument. Where, um, fighting a lot of other conservatives. That's an interesting note, yeah. Um, I should say too, you know, there were a few people um, who were uh, pro-Civil Rights Act mm -hmm. and uh, disagreed with um, National Review's editorial position on the civil rights movement. And these were thinkers um, mainly associated with um, the uh, political philosopher Leo Strauss, um, who thought that the federal government should guarantee civil rights for all Americans. Um, 
And then of course, later on, um, the National Review crowd is joined by the neoconservatives, uh, former Democrats, former liberals who, uh, in fact, didn't join the right earlier, mainly because of the issue of civil rights. So I tend to think that opposition to the civil rights movement and the civil rights acts um, actually limited conservatives' appeal uh, rather than expanded it. The um, so skipping skipping ahead uh, a few decades, um, it it strikes me particularly when we think about the debates of recent years uh, about the right and within the right that there is a, a kind of um, a historical view of the conservative movement and Republican Party circa 2012 as though it was the entire um, history of conservatism, that conservatism was always like that. And so um, when people, people are sometimes sort of dismayed or surprised about, the, um, about deviations from libertarian orthodoxy in conservatism, they're measuring it against a baseline of a moment that was actually unusually libertarian mm -hmm. for the right. Um, mm -hmm. And one thing that people don't, I think, appreciate is the extent to which some of these Trumpian or new right, new new right currents in conservatism are, in, you know, in some ways a, a return to a pre-Tea Party, less libertarian conservatism. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, frankly, I think some of the new new right people themselves don't get that. Uh, they think of themselves as being at war with a post-war conservative tradition that they regard as a lot more libertarian than it actually was. Um, I just wonder whether whether uh, whether you think that there's something to um, this uh, rambling point that I'm making. <laughs> no, I do. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time on the 2012 election because I think you're right that it was an inflection point and, and has kind of conditioned the way that um, many um, on the populist side of the equation view the the Republican Party and conservative politics. Um, one, there's that sense that um, the Romney-Ryan ticket in 2012 really ran on the economy alone. They didn't really stress um, uh, the social issues all that much. Uh, and that Romney thought that the economy and the slow recovery from the Great Recession uh, would be the, the path to the White House. What he didn't really realize was that, you know, voters tend to um, basically cast their ballots on the basis of the direction of the economy, right? And in this case, the, uh, the, the economy was recovering. So, you know, a lot of people were like, well, the economy is recovering and Mitt Romney reminds me of my boss and I don't like my boss. So um, that was, I think, a mistake. Um, the second thing was, uh, you're right to say that the um, the moment at that time, 20, 2009, with the birth of the Tea Party movement of 2012, uh, spent a lot of time um, speak, uh, talking about essentially uh, austerity um, uh, and entitlement reform in the form of um, Paul Ryan's roadmap to America's future, uh, a, um, a real um, coming to terms with the future of America's entitlement state. And um, that would be on the more libertarian or less socially conservative side. Um, and then the third thing, though, and I think this is responsible for a lot of the way that the populist right views 2012 is they didn't think that Mitt Romney was a fighter. Mm -hmm. that, was, that, that became really um, the, the buzzword on the populist right in the, over the last decade. They, the populist right wants someone who fights and Mitt Romney didn't fight. He was kind of beleaguered by the media, you know, when they would write stories about his dog on the car or they would follow him around Europe and the Middle East and say, you know, what about your gaffes? Um, and then in the, in, the, in the debate with Obama, the second debate, um, there came a moment where uh, uh, basically the moderator, Candy Crowley, took President Obama's side in a factual dispute over uh, how President Obama re responded to the attack on uh, the American consulate in Benghazi, Libya. 
on uh, September 11, 2012, and Romney didn't challenge the moderator's assertion. And this became a real sticking point on the populist right. They felt that they needed a champion who would have told that moderator, no, you're wrong, mm. you know, get out of the way. Um, and so 2012 became, I think, the, the beginning of this uh, search for a fighter on the part of the populist grassroots. And um, they, they found one uh, a few years later when Donald Trump arrived on the scene. Many of, many of the more Tea Party-ish elements, not entirely supportive of Trump at first, um, somewhat skeptical of his positions, uh, but then when he wins the nomination, uh, they come on uh, to his side and they have not left it since. Yeah. Um, yeah, they come on to his side when he wins the nomination and then some more when he wins the general election and then some more when he largely sticks with their positions mm -hmm. as, uh, as president, which, you know, a lot of people had some serious doubts about whether he was going to do that or not. Um, what is it, you know, I, I've been saying new, new right a couple times here just because, you know, there is this group now um, that incorporates a, a variety of different perspectives, but that all have in common the idea of, of breaking with the kind of um, limited government conservatism of the post-war years. And they're often called the New Right, but the funny thing is, of course, there was another group called the New Right in yeah, the late yeah. 1970s, which had some resemblance to that. Um, is it or is it too early to say what the what the reception of your book on the new right has been? How do they, uh, how are they greeting it? Um, I think it depends on what segment of the this new right you're talking about. Um, the elements of this new right, which are actually rather old, which kind of trace their origins mm -hmm. back to. Um, uh, the Pat Buchanan campaigns of the 1990s, uh, they're, uh, they're not fans of the book, uh, which, you know, was understandable because um, I'm not a Buchanan supporter and uh, I, make his, I make that known in the book. Um, uh, there are the other more nationalist conservatives, the netcons, um, uh, I, they've told me that they, they think it's a fair portrayal of their views. Uh, in their history. I try in the book to be as detached as possible. Um, uh, and it's only really at the beginning and the end where I let my own views um, uh, come out into the open. Uh, uh, what was important to me was telling the story and kind of establishing a, temp a, a, a base of knowledge that now other people can argue about. Because as you mentioned, Ramesh, uh, I find that so many, uh, I mean, so many young Americans in general, but young American conservatives in particular, don't actually know the history of the conservative movement or of the Republican Party. And um, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to, to have a text that I, I or other teachers could just kind of shove into their hands and say, here, read this, this is the, this is the story that you're inheriting. I mean, it is odd to me that a conservative in America would not seek to understand the history, the history that they're a part of, that they're trying to conserve. But I think that says a lot about changes in our media culture um, and also kind of the ascendance of the populist strain on the right. Uh, populism not necessarily all that attentive to history, actually, but more concerned with exerting the will of the people um, as soon as possible. Well, there is, of course, um, a if not a if not a full blown history, at least a story um, that a lot of populists tell in which an older uh, and more classically liberal um, version of conservatism, it just was a failure, right? Just just didn't win many of the fights um, that it engaged in. And the way this often gets phrased is, what did this conservatism conserve? Uh, and uh, are they right? Is that, is that your reading of the history? It is not my reading of the history. Um, I think a couple of things. One, it's very hard to prove a negative. So there are many, many ways in which uh, 
America could have taken a more leftward direction, which the conservative movement prevented over time. The power of saying no is an important one. Um, and there are plenty of bad ideas to which conservatives said no. Um, the second thing is we have to begin with our starting point. That is to say, you know, by what standard are we judging conservative successes? Have conservatives been, you know, all that successful since say 2012? Now, well, that's kind of hard to say. Um, there have been pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. If we go back though to the middle of the 20th century, I think the record has been a successful one. I really do. Considering where the conservative movement started from. We have to remember that at the end of World War II, as I say in the book, uh, conservatism was on the fringes of American political and intellectual life. It was not in 1950, considered uh, uh, mainstream at all to identify as an American conservative. A lot of work had to be done to bring conservatives into the conversation. And then think about the issue that really animated the American right for much of my story. And that is the issue of the Soviet Union and world communism. Well, we still have problems with Russia, as it's plain to see, but uh, the Soviet Union no longer exists. Uh, and world communism no longer exists. There are still communist states, but the idea of an ideology on the march that actually claims the sympathies of millions of people within Western democracies, that is no longer the case. That is a tremendous success. Um, I look at the journey of the conservative legal movement, beginning uh, with criticisms of the Warren Court, um, in the 1950s and 1960s, um, moving to the development of the doctrine of originalism, constitutional jurisprudence, the foundation of the Federalist Society in 1982 as a professional network for originalist lawyers. And then again, with setbacks and successes, um, culminating in Trump's three appointments uh, to the Supreme Court and the potential for reversal of Roe v. Wade uh, by the end of this term would be a huge success for the conservative legal movement. Um, one other example, I look at um, the welfare reform of uh, 1996 as in many ways, the consolidation of the Reagan approach to government uh, and the uh, implementation of ideas that conservatives had been um, discussing for decades, um, most famously in the work of uh, Charles Murray in his book, Losing Ground, published in 1984, but then also involving the work of scholars such as Robert Rector, um, James Q. Wilson, and others. Great success was achieved there with the end of to the way that um, welfare had been administered in this country and um, the imposition of a set of limits and conditions um, that have been quite successful um, empirically in um, lowering welfare roles and actually helping to reduce poverty. So I, I, think, I think the critics of the conservative movement who say it hasn't conserved anything, um, I think they have a romantic idea of what was possible and also a very nostalgic view of history. Um, and including the idea that they can somehow arrest history and freeze all change. I think a tr conservative understands that that's not possible. And what's important is how we deal with the change. Uh, what do we, what a do state we without the means of Change is without the means of its conservation, as Burke said. Yes, as I think, yes, the very, you know, if it comes from Burke, it must be good, right? Just from a conservative point of view, right? Exactly. And so, um, we have to improve what needs improvement. We also need to preserve what uh, is good. And um, I actually think the uh, record uh, can't be denied. And if you want it, if you want any proof, just ask American liberals uh, who think that uh, conservatives are winning, right? As much as conservatives think that conservatives are losing, American liberals seem convinced that conservatives are winning. Yeah. Um, one one other issue too, uh, organized labor, um, you know, which was a huge issue 
uh, for the American right beginning in the New Deal era. Um, of course, um, uh, labor in the private sector is greatly reduced in the American economy. Um, and the Janus decision um, by the Supreme Court a few terms ago uh, greatly inhibited even the role of the public sector unions. Um, so there too, I think, um, uh, conservatives can can look to success. Although, you know, of course, interestingly, the you know, some of um, the subcategories of the new kinds of conservatism sort of lament the decline of unions as a, as a right. mediating institution that uh, that used to uh, be, you know, stand between the individual and either the, you know, the global market or the federal state. Right. And, you know, um, unions uh, were often allies in the crusade against communism, right. the AFL-CIO in particular. Um, I think what um, the conservative movement has always stood for is the right to work. Mm -hmm. And then also a criticism of the public sector union, that is the government. Oh, well, they were with be... FDR. Right, right, <laughs> exactly. Uh, government shouldn't be bargaining with itself. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, if, if the new right disagrees with either of those ideas, then they're definitely, they're definitely new. Right. Um, I... Uh was reminded though, when we were talking about some of those economic issues of uh, one of Bill Buckley's favorite lines, um, he loved quoting T.S. Eliot on there are, no, there are no lost causes because there are no gained causes. And that has struck me um, watching some of the economic debates play out right now, whereas we saw, I would have thought that in the late seventies and eighties, we kind of killed the idea that corporate greed is the explanation for inflation and we need price controls. And we come up with a much sounder view about monetary restraint being key to it, but no, here we are, you know, and it, it, we should have known because um, Biden did say Milton Friedman's not in charge anymore. That was probably the cue for inflation to come roaring. Back. Right, yeah, exactly. But, you know, even on uh, tax rates, for example, I mean, if you think about the Biden tax proposal, it's not going back to the era of 70 percent 90 percent top marginal tax rates and in fact he's can you know he even limits the tax increases he's proposing to households making more than four hundred thousand dollars a year so the idea that somehow the tax burden should not um, hit the middle class which was a very reaganite idea and kind of part of the supply side economics that reagan brought to power that is still very powerful 40 years after reagan's election yeah. Um, it is probably now about time we should open it up for questions, although there are a lot more that I could ask you. I will just, uh, I will come up, I will ask my own questions to you the next time I see you at the office. Uh, but in the meantime, I will look for, um, uh, look through some of the questions that have been submitted in our Q&A. And I actually, the very first one I see is one that I did want to ask. Um, which is about uh, nationalism, the place of nationalism uh, within conservatism. Um, the, the questioner is asking about the militant and exclusive nationalism of today and how it fits into the long arc of U.S. conservative thought. But you know, there's been a range of opinion uh, among conservatives on whether nationalism of any kind uh, makes sense. Um, you know, William F. Buckley uh, I guess apocryphally said that he didn't have a nationalist bone in his body. Um, I've never been able to track down that quote to see what exactly he meant by it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, w w what do you think? Well, it is interesting that um, uh, the uh, right has often identified itself as nationalist, um, especially against uh, what in the uh, New Deal at World War II era was called the One Worlders. Um, the McCarthyites, the supporters of Joe McCarthy in the 1950s, actually referred to themselves as nationalists. Um, and then uh, there were other conservative thinkers, um, including the British conservative who was very influential among traditional uh, American thinkers, Roger Scruton, uh, they said that nationalism was a part of uh, conservatism, part of the right. So a lot matter, a lot depends on what we mean by nationalism. Is it, as the question says, kind of an exclusive blood and soil nationalism? The, that I think is uh, very um, 
foreign to, uh, mm. ironically, to, to the American constitutional tradition. It is much more like a European type blood and soil conservatism and nationalism. Uh, nationalism in the American context is often just meant uh, pride in, Amer in American nationhood, in, um, in American institutions, in the English language, um, in American uh, power, and also in um, Americans' freedom of maneuver on the world scene. So conservatives and the right have been very um, skeptical of international organizations, um, whether it was the League of Nations at the beginning of my story or the United Nations for much of the rest of it. Then the question is, you know, what form does that nationalism take? And in my book, I distinguish between uh, disengaged nationalists um, who were still nationalistic in their view of America, pride, pride in their country, uh, wanted America to be strong, but they were disengaged from the world. They didn't want, they, they thought that America was weakened uh, when America um, involved itself overseas. And after World War II and with the beginning of the Cold War, um, a new brand of nationalism, uh, engaged nationalism, uh, came to the fore. The idea that, again, American strength, American exceptionalism, um, but America needed to be involved overseas and engage with the world if it was going to defeat world communism. So since the end of the Cold War, both of these tendencies, disengaged nationalism and engaged nationalism, had been fighting uh, with, within the Republican Party, within the conservative movement. I say at the moment, the disengaged nationalists um, have a slight advantage. Right. Although with an asterisk, right? I mean, as given the, the pretty broad support among conservative voters for right. at least assistance to Ukraine. Yeah, assistance being the key, because right. I think it'd be hard to, to do much more. Um, but the assistance seems to be doing the job <laughs> at the moment. Right, but it you know, but it is controversial on the right, and maybe increasingly so. I mean, there are three mm -hmm. people who you know didn't want to be there uh, in favor of it, and then sort of felt they had to come along, and now more recently seem like they they're reverting back to their right. initial opposition. Um, yeah, and I think also it was um, I think there were there was a kind of conservatism that thought of the Cold War as an exception, you know, because you had this 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 you know this incredible. Uh, you had a worldwide threat to American interests that also thought of itself as revolutionary, left-wing, and atheist, that you had people like Patrick Buchanan and Phyllis Schlafly who were kind of natural isolationists who's, who sort of said, well, not this time. But as soon as it was over, both of them basically thought, well, we, can, we don't have to be in favor of this kind of engagement anymore. Right, and, and then the right begins looking in some ways like that pre-Cold War right. So, so in some ways, the Cold War was something of an exception. So um, I think, uh, you know, one doesn't want to paint with too broad a brush here. Here I'm, I'm sort of riffing off of, uh, of another question that, that uh, has come in. Um, but it does seem to me that the, the rise of populism on the right has at least coincided with a return and a really kind of flowering of conspiratorial thinking on the right. Now, this definitely has a history within conservatism, but I'm not sure it ever has, has reached the heights um, <clears throat> that it has in recent years, where, for example, I think President Trump's winning the Republican nomination Act owed something to his embrace of a conspiracy theory about President Obama's birth certificate, for example. Um, is this is this somehow sort of naturally um, part of the populist package? Um, is there a way to uh, to do what previous eras of conservatives did and and beat some of that conspiratorial thinking back? I do think that when you study the long history of American populism, you see that conspiracy theories often accompany it. And then it's a, uh, it, the issue is, um, do they dominate it? And I think that populism can be positively charged and it can be negatively charged. So much depends on the leadership 
So if I look at a figure like Reagan, as we were saying earlier in our conversation, he definitely had ties to the populist wing of the right. Um, and in fact, in his own worldview, really trusted the decisions of ordinary men and women, as opposed to, uh, as he often put it, a, a, a out of touch elite in a far off capital, right? Um, and yet, he he did not succumb to uh, conspiracy theories. He did not promote conspiracy theories. Uh, he denounced racism and white supremacy in his famous speech to the National Association of Evangelicals in 1982. Um, and you know, leaders they define the alternatives, they set the agenda, and they also um, provide an example to their followers. And so, I do think the difference between a Reagan and a Trump. Uh, is the difference between a populism that um, is is more agenda oriented and forward looking, and a populism that is more conspiratorial uh, and also more susceptible to um, kind of demagoguery. Mm. Right, um, and we're going to take. I'm going to take a. Excuse me for that. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Um, another question uh, that has come in, and uh, I think I'll, I'll just read this one verbatim. Do you feel like modern conservatives, especially the younger ones you mentioned, who seem to have no substantial knowledge of their own history, actually want a critical look at their movement's past? Do you in any way feel like they'd see any criticism of this history, like the conservative opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 64, for example, as a kind of as akin to CRT, even if it comes from a uh, conservative source that is critical race theory. <laughs> well, which, I hope not. <laughs> which we've seen, you know, does get um, <clears throat> the the phrase does get applied rather permissively. Oh boy, yeah, it, it does. It does. Um, I find that uh, in my teaching uh, and in my uh, mentoring of young people, uh, there is a desire to learn more about the past. Mm -hmm. um, and um, really, uh, uh, there's a search for sources that can provide them um, some insight into the past. Uh, so um, whether they were able to take criticism, uh, you know, what's the word about college campuses? They have snowflakes, you know? Uh, I thought that conservatives aren't kind of sensitive snowflakes, that they're able to have a more hard-edged tough-minded, realistic view of the world. Certainly that's the type of conservatism I identify with. Um, and so, um, you know, the choice is really up to them, but the, these are the facts. And look, there are a lot of, I, in my view, blots on the record of the American left um, and uh, a turn toward radicalism on the part of the American left, uh, specifically in the late 1960s, early 1970s, which in my view is, part of the reason that the American electorate shifted right and eventually elected Ronald Reagan. So if I were a conservative, I would be very worried if I am a conservative and I'm, I'm worried about repeating the mistakes the left made uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s by going too far, um, by, uh, by embracing um, an extremist politics. The American people do not like extremes. I think this is clear. Um, they don't like extremes of personality, which is why they didn't reelect Donald Trump. They also don't like ideological extremes, which is why they seem to be uh, have, holding a very negative view of President Biden's attempts to be FDR and LBJ and Barack Obama all in one package. I, <clears throat> I was talking um, earlier about some of the parallels between our day and the 1970s, but I wonder if if um, if this and could end up being one of those times of uh, a flux on the right that is sort of akin to what happened in the 70s, where sort of we look back and we think, um, you know, sort of th there's a kind of logical progression to the events. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, Reagan could have made different choices, or um, somebody else could have um, taken that kind of role and and uh, and take and made different choices. Um, but it does strike me that uh, it was also a moment of ferment on the right, and it was also a moment of um, uncertain leadership at the top. Um, 
And it's interesting that we had these three uh, one term or less presidents, um, right? I mean, sort of Nixon's aborted second term, you have Ford's partial term, and then you have Carter's one term. Um, and we just went through a period where we had a bunch of eight-year terms, an unusually long period of eight-year terms. But then maybe with Trump and with Biden, we're we're back in that kind of 1970s experience again. Yeah, yeah, I, I think there's something to that. And, you know, also what you're uh, uh, point about contingency is very important too. You know, um, Reagan's career could have ended in 1976. In 1976, he challenges that sitting Republican president, Gerald Ford, for the nomination of the Republican Party. Reagan loses most of the opening contests. His campaign is on the floor. And it's not until the North Carolina primary and the work done by Senator Jesse Helms that uh, Reagan wins in North Carolina and is able to resuscitate his campaign and fight all the way to the convention floor. If North Carolina hadn't gone to Reagan, there might have been no President Reagan. Right. Uh, because if, really, or, I mean, what if he, he had, what if he'd won in 1976? That right. you know, then you, maybe he loses. He seems too extreme. The party decides, well, that's not the path we want to take. Yeah, I mean, you can do that. You can also do that counterfactual. I happen to think he would have been successful in 1976 anyway, but, um, but you know, it would have been a very different history, right? I mean, also the Soviet Union mm -hmm. may have been in a different place as well. Um, though, you know, the Soviets, uh, you know, Reagan famously didn't meet with any of this, his Soviet counterparts during his first term. And one, one day, you know, Sam Donaldson shouted from the bushes, you know, Reagan, why don't why don't you meet with any of these Soviet leaders? And Reagan shot back, they keep dying on me, you know, but uh, he was trying to wait, I think, until uh, a more amenable leadership uh, showed up in Moscow and eventually it did in the person of Mikhail Gorbachev. So yeah, we can play these counterfactuals. And I think the reason we do is because there's that randomness or contingency to history. We just really don't know. I mean, think about, think about what, what 40,000 votes in three states in 2016 changed the world, right? I mean, if uh, Donald Trump won a sizable electoral college victory, but it was also a narrow one in the actual vote count, and of course he lost the popular vote. Yeah, and then, um, and then an even smaller number in 2020. In 2020, right, could have reelected him, right? So um, the, these things are very touch and go. Uh, and trying to get that sense into the history, I think is a is a is a challenge for any historian. So <clears throat> looking forward, um, even though you're a historian, um, <clears throat> do you see any um, any weaknesses in the populist uh, streak that could be its undoing or or do you see it's do you think you know at least for the next few years it is just going to continue to be in the in the ascendance? Well, you and I speak on the evening of the uh, Pennsylvania uh, primary, where the contest seems to be between the MAGA candidate, Dr. Oz, uh, and Trump endorsed, and the ultra MAGA candidate, Kathy Barnett, who uh, is not Trump endorsed, and who says that the MAGA movement is greater than Trump. So there you really have um, the fight happening on the populist side, the more movement conservative candidate who also says he's MAGA, the David McCormick, a former Bush official. Um, he's in the mix as well, but he seems to be um, trailing. So uh, I, you can also look at the recent primary in Ohio where J.D. Vance won a narrow uh, victory, but he was Trump endorsed. Our, our uh, former ADM colleague. Our former colleague, yeah. um, but who is now really the most prominent political spokesman for the new right position that we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, he has, of course, the edge in the Senate race in Ohio, which is increasingly red. Uh, I do think that uh, the populist moment has not ended. I do think the Trump era has not ended. Um, and so the right needs to think of itself more and more as a coalition and constitutional conservatives um, movement conservatives also ne need to recognize that they are not necessarily in the same position of leadership or influence that they were uh, even 10 years ago. Did anything 
particularly surprise you in researching the history of American conservatism? I was um, really drawn to the character of Robert Taft, uh, who I may have mentioned earlier. Um, he was known as Mr. Republican. He was the son of William Howard Taft. Uh, he was elected to the Senate from Ohio in 1938. Um, he was a critic of the New Deal, a critic of American involvement in World War II, but had an idiosyncratic uh, uh, political portfolio, um, ran unsuccessfully as kind of the representative of the pre-World War II right for president uh, and for the Republican nomination, he didn't get it. But um, a very interesting figure and I enjoyed reading and researching and writing about him. It also surprised me uh, in all honesty, how much uh, I wrote about Patrick Buchanan, um, mm -hmm. the commentator and presidential candidate. He shows up in my story in 1965 when he meets Richard Nixon and becomes an aide to Richard Nixon. In fact, Nixon's liaison to what were called the Buckleyites, the uh, National Review conservatives. And um, he plays a role working for Nixon in the White House, for Reagan in 1986, running for president in 1990s. And in those presidential candidacies, in many ways, laying the ideological framework that would come to be known as Trumpism. So I'd say I was, um, a little bit surprised at how big a role Pat Buchanan played in the history of the right, though in now, as I think about it, it actually makes quite a good deal of sense. Yeah, I mean, I suppose there's a way in which Trumpism is kind of Buchananism minus a little bit of religion and plus support for Israel. That's right, yes. He didn't. He didn't go down that particular cul-de-sac. Uh, and you know, it, it was very savvy. It was, I think it, is uh, evidence of Trump's political uh, shrewdness that he understood that um, hostility to Israel uh, would deny him entree into one of the most important Republican constituencies, the evangelical community. Um, yeah, well, he he was he was pretty savvy about a lot of those uh, touchstones on the right. He knew the things that he could. Um, deviate from the pre-Trump orthodoxy on and things that he couldn't. And um, uh, on, I, I think you'd have to say that the selection of issues where he could move and where he couldn't, he was pretty savvy. Yeah, I think that's right. And uh, good at coalition management, which might be odd yeah. considering how disorganized his White House was. But uh, Trump always pays attention to his base as we can even see in um, kind of his positioning on vaccines for COVID, right? I mean, he's kind of dropped that um, arrow from his uh, repertoire, uh, his rhetorical repertoire. Um, and also, you know, in outsourcing a lot of policy to even more traditional movement conservatives. So the judges go to the federal society, the tax plan goes to the supply siders, the guns, he's firmly on the side of the National Rifle Association. Um, he was very good at managing the right. Yeah. He was not so good at appealing to the center and that's what cost him a second term. Yeah, well, and what he did, you're right. So there were about five minutes um, where he broke with the NRA, if you remember, and then his, his, his team sort of reined him back in. Where, yeah, know. over the mansion to me, uh, gun background yeah. check bill. Yeah, and then, yeah. And he assault weapon. For, yeah, he told, he told Pelosi and Biden, well, anyway. The, the story of the uh, Trump White House is, uh, is a universe in itself, I suppose. Right. And maybe that will have to be your next book. But in the meantime, I would like to thank you for joining us for this conversation and thank the Free Library for hosting it. Thank uh, you, our, our audience, for participating and sending in some great questions. And good night to everyone. Thank you.